Um, thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank you especially for the, the chance to present on um, Professor Eltis and my own experience in working with an open access resource. Our resource is um, different uh, from some of the other discussions we've been talking about. We've been talking very specifically about um, author self-archiving of uh, journal articles that have been accepted for publication. This is a different resource, um, so it comes with different baggage. But at the same time, I think uh, it's really a tremendous example of the possibilities of open access and why you might even have open access for things much bigger than a single journal article. Um, for the past four years, I have been working as project manager on the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. This database is available online at www.slaveorigins.org. I would normally invite you to rush to your laptops and look at it while I'm talking. I have no problem with that, but I know that there's interference uh, with the Wi-Fi, so I'll tell you, don't run yet. And if we have time at the end of this and we're taking questions, um, please do. Uh, we'd be glad to um, talk about that more specifically by looking at the site uh, live. Um, I will just tell you that this uh, database, uh, which we call Voyages Database for short, um, is a result not just of those four years of project development, although I feel very proud of that, but it is in fact um, the result of over four decades of individually pursued research by historians working in archives across the globe. So it's a really monumental research effort. Um, joining me in this presentation is David Eltis, um, one of those historians who has now spent the greater part of his life researching the transatlantic slave trade and who spent the past two decades pursuing this online, open access, comprehensive, searchable database of the slave trade. Um, I will say, by way of introduction for David, since we're doing lots of introductions today, he is a, an historian first, but a digital innovator by necessity. And I hope what will become clear as we talk about the evolution of this project and the creation of this database is that this was, um, this was a resource that very much was a natural response to the needs emerging from David and other scholars' research and from the paths that technology opened to them. And Martin Halbert didn't mention this in his introduction, but in 2005, he collaborated with um, David Eltis uh, to, on a proposal to expand and migrate this database online that, you will, that we'll be talking about today. So um, he was very instrumental uh, in that process to do this. Um, let's see, I'll start moving some slides. Okay, uh, what is Voyages? Um, put very simply, it is primarily a database of over 35,000 records of transatlantic slaving voyages, which is roughly 82% of the estimated total volume of the four centuries of transatlantic slave trading. It is an expansion uh, and a republication of a CD-ROM publication, which was called uh, the Transatlantic Slave Trade, and it was published by Cambridge University Press in 1999. But Voyage was not merely a republication in response to significant limitations, as we'll talk about um, later, we made deliberate changes in how the data could be used and updated in this online site. Um, we also took steps to preserve and share the data and the underlying code base. And a key change, critical change for us, was making the site open access. As we'll discuss, this was essential to the site's availability, to the scholars, the educators, and the general public who would use it. Ultimately, we see open access as essential to the site's long-term growth and vitality. Uh, another characteristic of Voyages that we see as both emblematic of and critical to digital scholarship in general is its collaborative development. It is a resource built on collaboration at many levels, individual and institutional. And it began with collaboration between scholars well before it became an online database, to which members of the public can now contribute data. The future security of that data, as well as the underlying code base, rely on digital preservation networks, which are maintained by multiple institutions. We are now beginning to develop institutional partnerships as well around open source to help maintain the code base and do future developments. Um, I see voyages as particularly illustrative of the ways in which digital scholarship in the process of expanding its impact and its audiences increasingly depends on broader networks of support, and from supplying and vetting data on slaving voyages to maintaining software and server for the website. 
Uh, so again, in this presentation, we'll talk about the development of voyages, um, but without further ado, uh, let me pass this over to David to talk more about the history of voyages. Uh, yes, one of the first things I learned from Martin Halbert was uh, never go on stage with a live animal and never make a presentation with a live website. So I'm afraid we're stuck with, um, with uh, screenshots and uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I'd just like to reinforce the, the fact that this, the slave trade lends itself to this kind of operation for, for the, main, the main reason for that being that in fact the, the sources for the slave trade are much better than the sources for free migration simply because it was a business and records exist around the Atlantic world which we've spent a long time trying to pull together. Um, Liz has talked about some of the more conceptual issues, but I'd just like to take you through some of the main features of the site and give you a bit of background on why we ended up with what we've got. Uh, the home page, which you can see now, is made up of three major uh, search interfaces, and uh, I'm going to start with the second one, which is the estimates page. Um, even though the database itself is the cornerstone of the site. The important thing is to recognize here is that this is in fact a work of interpretation as well as just a database. And the estimates um, table, which you can see there, represents what we think uh, constituted the size and direction of the transatlantic slave trade over uh, 350 years. Uh, the interface allows you to, in effect, provide any produce any combination of region of, dis region of embarkation in Africa, region of disembarkation in the Americas, year, and the flag of the carrier responsible um, for bringing um, Africans to the new world. And as you can see, there are uh, uh, three tabs at the top of the uh, main part of the results section. Um, and what you're looking at now is the table tabs, but you can present any search that you conduct in the form of um, a map, which I'll show you in, in a second, and a timeline, which, uh, which you can see here. So in effect, you can select any combination of year, geography, and uh, flag, and s see what we think are the um, estimated numbers involved. <clears throat> and in addition to that, um, you can use various slides to highlight and underline the, um, the results that you've, that you've, that you've chosen. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, uh, there's the names database, the second of the three search interfaces. This is based on records of 67,000 individuals who were actually uh, removed from slave ships during the abolition era in the 19th century. Uh, they were taken to international courts which were located around the Atlantic world and in the process of being um, uh, liberated, <coughs> the details of the individual were taken down and recorded in huge ledgers, which we have, in effect, computerized. And the great benefit of the great um, finding here is the African name of the individual. And we are actually using this information to move to a second phase um, called Origins, which is a separate, se a separate website, and which we expect to, will be able to give you the uh, uh, allow people to see a geographic profile of the African sources of the slave trade as opposed to the transatlantic voyages, which you can see in the, uh, in the other two interfaces. Uh, so what you see here is, the, is a list of the first 20 of 67,000 individuals. And again, you've got a search interface on the left-hand side, which allows you to select um, by various criteria. Uh, in addition to that, there's a, uh, th there are 
uh, images in the website. Uh, this gives you a thumbnail view of individuals who are actually um, associated with the vessels. Everything on the website is referenced to the individual voyages which form the, the main uh, search interface, which I'll come to in a second. And in addition to that, we've got uh, interpretive maps, um, which you can actually spin through very quickly and get a picture of the slave trade uh, probably in two minutes or less. Uh, this one in particular shows you the overall um, geography of the slave trade and <laughs> indicates the links between Africa and the Americas. It actually also shows the fact that the transatlantic slave trade was not the only uh, slave trade to which Africa was subjected. You can see here very clearly the connections with uh, North Africa and the Indian Ocean. Uh, the database itself, this is the third of the three interfaces that I introduced on the home page, uh, is the, the heart of the site. You can see here um, 20 voyages uh, and one, two, three, four, five, six, six variables. The 20 voyages represent a small sample of the 35,000 uh, which we have on the site. And the six um, variables, uh, six columns indicating the variables, uh, represent six of, um, I think it's what, 135? I forget. <laughs> it's 200. Uh, well, ultimately, it's actually, what we're dealing with now is actually 300. But I think on the site, there's only 135 variables. Um, so you've got a very small piece of, what, of the data. and. Uh, the database table, each, so each row in that table constitutes a voyage, and each column represents a piece of information about the voyage. Uh, the, actually, can we just go back to the screen? Uh, you can select any, again, a wide range of combinations of these variables, and if you look at the tabs along the top, you can see what you can do with the selection that you make. You can get summary statistics, uh, tables, um, you can build your own custom graphs, uh, you can have a timeline very like the one we just looked at with the estimates interface, and in addition to that we've got um, maps in which uh, we can indicate very clearly the numbers uh, leaving the African coast or arriving in the Americas and indeed departing from Europe or the Americas um, as the ships did to get the slaves. Uh, and, it, and also note the, uh, the fact that we've, we've got a large number of sources in each, for each voyage. Uh, in this presentation of the data you can see in the final column on the right hand side a list of sources. Uh, these are obviously uh, in short form, but you can expand these very easily and track down exactly where we got the information from. Uh, in terms of development, the database, as Liz suggests, actually started life around 1968 as a bunch of um, uh, cards, um, which we fed into an IBM machine. And uh, it eventually became, by the, in, in the 1990s, a CD-ROM. I think we started out in 1993 with the first NEH grant. Uh, and we were thinking at that time of charging, I think, $1,500 for the CD-ROM. CD-ROMs were just coming on stream then. And uh, by the time we actually produced the CD-ROM, the price had come down to a mere 200 uh, we, the research endeavor really came from the fact that there were lots of different databases collected by individuals, individual scholars, 
And we began this phase of the project by um, really by a chance meeting in, a, in an archive where two, two of us decided that it wouldn't it be a good idea if we actually put the, this material together. Um, the, uh, the, I think the key, one of the key features of the site is the fact that we are opening up contributions. The, the po basically, we know that there are many people out there who have material that we do not have. And we are therefore, uh, we've spent a fair amount of resources creating um, a contribute page where people can register and both correct our data and um, expand it. There are new voyages as well as new information on existing voyages. Uh, in fact, I've actually just spent yesterday afternoon in an archive in Dallas uh, collecting new information from a 1776 logbook of a slave ship, which um, an individual in a very large house um, had purchased from a dealer um, five years ago. And uh, I, of course, have digital images of this and will be putting the data into the uh, database itself in the very near future. The idea is that what I was doing yesterday will be done by hundreds of others over the course of the next few years, and eventually I think we'll end up with a much bigger and more complete set of data than we've got now. Do we have the contribute page? Yeah, we don't have the actual live page. Yeah. So, well, this just shows you, this is the invitation to contribute. I think the, the point, uh, the final point I want to make in this section is just to stress that the the route to voyages passed through um, the web, uh, pass, came to the web via the Du Bois Institute in Harvard, the University of Hull. Uh, we got major funding from the UK government, for example, uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Victoria University in New Zealand. There are, in other words, there are a, a project a project such as this draws on funding from around the Atlantic and indeed the Pacific world, and it draws not only funding but scholarly knowledge from an area which um, a range of people that I couldn't have possibly imagined uh, when I started my career some 40 years ago. So we now come to the question of why we chose to make Voyages Open Access, and I think it's sort of self-evident from, from what I've said already. But the, I think that the project essentially grew with, with computers. It began with the computer revolution in the 60s and um, has more or less kept pace with it since. Um, and I think the, the, the funding that we've received has been largely government, and I think that in itself drove us to the open access position. Um, but there's also the fact that the, we had the choice back in the 90s of actually going with uh, Cambridge University Press, who published the CD-ROM, and Cambridge were actually prepared to move this to the web, um, and indeed they got several estimates um, to do so. And I think uh, those of you that are familiar with Cambridge will know that they do a fairly wide range of electronic publications and charge, of course. Um, they have the historical statistics of the United States uh, and several other projects which are basically operated on a user pay basis. Uh, the I think the thing which prevented us going down that road was actually the award of a grant from, um, in this case, uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Board in the United Kingdom. And this was backed up with NEH funding uh, thereafter. Uh, but for a time there, it, this project could have very easily gone down the uh, private use road. As we've seen today, I think that road was probably leading to a dead end, uh, but we weren't sure of that at the time. 
so the, I guess we'll, we're running out of time, so we'll move on to the question of very quickly of what's this, what choosing open access is meant for us. And maybe you can take over at this point. Okay. I don't want to tax, <laughs> tax your ears or hands over here. I'll go very, very quickly to what this has meant for us and just hit a few points. Um, I, I do actually want to go back just one point and um, really hit the point again that the CD-ROM database, um, though cheap in terms of the time period, um, it was out of the reach of a lot of people. It was over $200, um, aside from the fact that it was um, even if it was adopted by your library, that meant you had to use it in your library, and that meant it wasn't really available for use in a classroom, or it wasn't really available for use by a lot of students for assignments, and it certainly wasn't available easily for the general public, which really limited our audience, including the Texan that David uh, just met yesterday. So there is really a broader public to which we knew this would serve, um, aside from the fact that also it just wasn't easily updated. Um, what does it mean for us to be open access? What it means is that um, more people can access this database anywhere, anytime. We have people contacting us. Um, uh, there was a linguist who contacted me from uh, Munich, Germany, who said I'm looking at the, I mean, linguistics seems to be a theme today, but uh, he was saying I'm studying the uh, transition of languages from Senegambia to Korakau. So this is a resource for him. Um, we were contacted two days ago by an independent researcher studying Quakers in Rhode Island who has information on a cap an owner of slaving ventures there who is not currently listed in some of these voyages and would like to contribute that information. These are people who we didn't, did not reach um, likely before. I mean, there's part of this challenge is we don't have baselines. There was easier, an earlier discussion about metrics. Um, this is something we actually can track now with our open access site. We do use Google Analytics to track um, where the data is being used, what pages are getting a lot of hits, when. Um, so that sort of information is very useful for us to turn around and say to the library director, this resource is valuable to this many people on this regular recurring basis. Um, the final point I would like to say about, um, there's some other points. Of, but if there's going to be a published proceedings, you'll just read it there. But um, for us, uh, we are really looking at next steps. We've already made the open access move. We're already committed to that. I would say to any institutions who are considering open access that you really view it as a commitment to long-term um, Provide provision of scholarship. It is different in our case because we are dealing with a database software. We're dealing with a lot of other aspects that you don't have to deal with because you have an infrastructure already set up with an institutional repository. But we see this um, as our next step moving forward to really develop broader networks of collaboration to work with other places like we are working with the Wilberforce Institute for Slave Study of Slavery and Emancipation at the University of Hull to um, make mirror sites of the, uh, of the uh, Voyages website to also share the code and develop and maintain that code. But it is making these steps and reaching out and figuring out ways that we can do, do better leverage our own resources to keep this uh, site going. And I know we're out of time, so <laughs> thank you very much.